So now let's discuss how to solve this equation. We have a set of linear equations, and it, it can be potentially a huge number of linear equations. So if nx and ny are both on the order of 100, you get like 10,000 equations. If both are on the order of 1,000, you get like a million equations. So how to solve a million equations, a million coupled equations? So the best way is to put it into matrix form. And one of the things I think you learn through going this class is learn how to put equations into matrix form. Once you put equations into matrix form, it becomes suddenly becomes easy to solve with computers. Okay. And there was a person who was a, a professor in, uh, in computer science who said that computers are really good at only two things. One is moving and transforming data. The other is solving linear equations, like doing linear algebra, basically. And doing linear algebra requires you to transform whatever problem you need to solve into matrices. And this is what we are going to do. This is what we are going to do, is to transform this equation okay, into a matrix. So first of all, how big does the matrix have to be? So let's, let's write, write out the matrix. So you can see I plan this to be big, right? So this times the solution is equal to a right-hand side. How big is the matrix? So let's say given this number of equations and this number of unknowns. It's the same, right? So it's nx minus 1 times ny minus 1 columns, nx minus 1 times ny minus 1 rows. The number of equations stands for the number of rows. Exactly. The number of unknowns is the number of columns. So before we write down this matrix, let's first uh, write down the unknowns and uh, uh, equation, the right-hand side of the equations. So each equation is one line corresponding, one row corresponding to the matrix. And the right-hand side should be equal to the corresponding right-hand side of the equation. So let's write down F11 here. And of course, there are two ways to order the right-hand side. You can start with F12, F13, or you can go ahead and write F21, F23, uh, sorry, F21 and F31. So let's here adopt, uh, let's adopt the C or Python type of indexing. So we go F12, F13, all the way to F1 and Y. Minus 1, yes, thank you. And if you are using... So, so this is basically how a C or Python put an array into memory, because computer memory is actually a 1D, a huge 1D array. And if you want to represent a 2D or 3D array of data or matrix, you can arrange the matrix, arrange the data in the matrix in two ways. One is you arrange the uh, second index first, or you arrange the first index first. If you use C or Python, you, you change the second in index first. And after you cycle through all the second indices, you begin to increment the first index by one. In MATLAB or Fortran, is the other way. You increment the first index first. And after you cycle through the first index, you start to increment the second index by one. So either way is fine. I don't have any preference of one way or the other. F22, F23, etc. So you can think of there is a mental or a logical separation here. But the computer actually doesn't care. And I will write dot, dot, dot. The last one is going to be F of nx minus 1, 1, and all the way to F nx minus 1, and y minus 1. So as we arrange the equations that way, it makes sense to arrange the unknowns in the same way. F11, F, oh, so u11, u12, etc. to u1 and y minus 1, u21, u22, all the way to u2 
and y minus 1 and etc going through all the u i's and finally we have u of nx minus 1 1 and u of nx minus 1 and y minus 1 can somebody look at the equation and tell me what the matrix is going to look like first it's going to be very sparse that's a very good observation why is it sparse because the matrix each row of the matrix has nx minus 1 times ny minus 1 entries and only how many of them are non-zero five right if if i and j are away from 1 or nx minus 1 and y minus 1, 5 of them are going to be non-zero. If they are close to the boundary, if i and j are close to the boundary, even less are going to be non-zero. Right? So at most, 5 in a row is going to be non-zero. So let's set an example. The first row, we are considering something equal to f11, which means this equation has to be i equal to 1, j equal to 1. Which indices are going to be non-zero? I mean, which entries on the matrix is going to be non-zero? Is the first entry going to be non-zero? Because we have this term and this term in the equation, right? So u11 one one is going to appear in the equation, right? And the coefficient is going to be minus 2 over delta x squared minus 2 over delta y squared. That's right. And if you think a little bit carefully for all the other i's and j's, the same coefficient are going to appear on the diagonal. Right? In the matrix, the diagonal means the corresponding entry of the unknown is multiplied by the diagonal entry and equal to the same entry on the right hand side which means we are looking for the term of ij in this in this linear combination right the same ij that appears on the right hand side so this is always going to be the same number up to all the way to the last one minus 2 over delta x squared minus 2 over delta y squared Okay, a big task is done. We've figured out the diagonal entries. And let's, let's, let's cross out these diagonal entries from this equation. We already took care of these two. Uh, by going through the right-hand side, we also took care of these two. And now we have four terms left. Okay, again, if we uh, focus on the first row again, what other terms are non-zero? The one immediately to the right-hand side of the diagonal is going to be non-zero because of which term? Because of i plus 1j or ij plus 1? ij plus 1, right. Because we order the f's and use, because we order the u's in this way. So u of 1, 2 it's going to be corresponding to this term, right? This is u of 1, 2. So the coefficient of this one is, of course, 1 over delta y squared because we are looking at this term over here, okay? Is there any other terms that is going to be non-zero? The one below the diagonal, but that is another row. We are focusing on the first row. There are two more. So first of all, if j is equal to 1, this term is gone. Oops. Oops. Right, so if, if j is equal to 1, this term is 0. And if i is equal to 1, this term is also 0. So we don't need to take care of these two terms. The only term left is ui plus 1 and j. Where is that? Exactly. You need to skip over a bunch of zeros and comes to the entry, comes to the, which entry? Comes to the n-wide entry, right? 
So this is the n y th entry, and I have one over delta x square. All right. Okay. Now look at the second row. Now j is equal to two. We have the same one over delta y square on the upper diagonal because. We still need to take care of this term. This is u of one three. Now we have one more term on the lower diagonal that <coughs> corresponds to this one. That is also one over delta y square. Okay, and the delta one over delta x term is also going to be shifted by one because j is shifted by one. All right, and this. Goes all the way up to here or here. So let's consider this as the first block of the matrix. The first block of the matrix has the first block of the matrix. If you don't consider this one over delta x squares, it's going to have the same tridiagonal structure as the finite difference in one D case. Right, but in addition to that, we get a diagonal block. We get another block that appears over here. That is just the one over delta x square on the diagonal of the block. And now the question is: When we get to the last entry, when we are looking at the last entry, f of one and y minus one. We have the same thing minus two over delta x square minus two over delta y square over here. We have the same thing one over delta y square over here. Do we have a minus? Uh, do we have a one over delta y square over here on the right hand side of this diagonal? Is multiplied by u i uh, u of one and y minus one. The upper diagonal one over delta y square is multiplied by this, so u i of j plus one. But u i of j plus one in this case is u one and y, which is zero. So we don't need to put anything here. In fact, if we put anything here, it will be wrong because it will be multiplied by u of two one, right? So, so we are already at this point. Well, actually, yeah, we are already at. Uh, so let's say let's say four is n y. We are already at this point of the grid. We don't need to multiply by here because the boundary is zero. And the next entry, the next entry in this factor is going to be. Here is going to be jumped to here, and the differential operator here has nothing to do with this grid point, right? So there is nothing here that that couples u one and one minus one and u two one, right? So the ordering of the grid points are this, this, this jump over to here, and this, this. Jump over back to here, and this, and this over here, and this point is not coupled to this point, so there is nothing here. So the so the second i index or the second column of uh, in this plot is the same, but we are going to have a block that is the same as this, and in addition to A one over delta x block over here. We also get a one over delta x squared block over here. All right, and so so at the end we are going to get what's called a pentadiagonal structure. So we get one diagonal over here, one diagonal immediately above, one diagonal immediately below, and one diagonal that is n y minus one away. From the diagonal, and we also get another diagonal, n y minus one below the main diagonal. 